When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett, and this is science for people who give a shit. We give you the tools you need to fight for a better future for everyone. The context straight from the smartest people on Earth and the action steps you can take to feel better and support them. Our guests are scientists, doctors, PhD students, nurses, farmers, policymakers, activists, journalists, CEOs, uh, even a reverend. This is your friendly reminder that you can send questions, thoughts, and feedback to us on Twitter at importantnotimp, or you can email us at questions at importantnotimportant.com. You can join tens of thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at importantnotimportant.com, and also check out some of our merchandise at importantnotimportant.com slash store. This week's episode is talking about the end of the universe. I promise it's an awesome time. Our guest is the fantastic Serafina Nance. She is a, boy, she's a PhD candidate at Berkeley, an author, a health advocate, science communicator. She's a, a dog mom. Um, and all of that truly, truly undersells her journey and her accomplishments uh, to the nth degree. And uh, that's what I want to focus on today is how she got to where she is and why. So let's go talk to Serafina now. Our guest today is Serafina Nance, and together we're going to get a little meta and have some fun, and we're going to talk about how the universe ends uh, for each of us, for all of us, and if we can do anything to prepare for it or even prevent it. Uh, Serafina, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if you could quickly, for the people, tell us who you are and what it is you do. Sure. So I am a graduate student in astrophysics at UC Berkeley. I do science communication, I'm a women's health advocate, and I write books, and yeah, I do a lot of things, all science-related. Anything else you want to uh, add to that? I host a TV show uh, called Constellations on Seeker. It's about astronomy. I have a dog. His name is Comet. I'm a dog mom. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll take it. That's fine. That's enough. <laughs> I feel like that's enough. It's crazy. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. A uh, reminder to, I guess, you and everybody out there, we will ask some action-oriented questions, and then what we like to do is get into how our community can support what you got going on. Great. Thank um, you so much. Because we learned early on that folks, even the nerdiest, most invested folks, can only listen to, for example, like enough conversation about climate change before you want to close your eyes and like drive into traffic. So yeah. we finish with action steps that people can actually do something about like specific data driven stuff. And it, it Great. helps the thing, but it also helps people feel a little better. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, awesome. Uh, Serafina, we like to start with one important question to start this fiasco. Serafina, why are you vital to the survival of the species? Whoa, that's a big question. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Be bold. I, I think it's really important to ask big questions that anchor us and our perspective in the context of the universe so we can understand a little bit more about where we come from, how we got here, and you know whether we're alone, whether uh, how we can sort of traverse the cosmos and explore the rest of the universe. So sort of these big questions that, to me, inform our humanity 
are really important to uh, evolving as as a species and 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 retaining a semblance of uh, humanity as we move forward. I like it. That works. We'll take it. A lot of words. Well done. That's perfect. <laughs> cool. Lo- you will never be faulted for a lot of words on this podcast. <laughs> All I do is just ramble on, and my editor's like, "God damn it, another one." Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. Glad I'm not alone. So let's get into this thing. Uh, let's start by setting some context for folks. Serafina, how is the actual universe going to end? So the universe goes through different stages as it evolves. And towards the end, the fate of the universe is basically that it is going to continue expanding and accelerating that expansion forever. And at that point, so, you know, we're hundreds of billions of years in the future, uh, the space between each celestial object is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and stretch until you have isolated stars and you have isolated planets and everything sort of cools and fades away until we're left to be plunged into darkness. Sounds like my typical Friday. (laughs) So that's hundreds of billions of years, which is good. That's helpful. Uh, Let's get a little more intimate with it. Talk to me about uh, our galaxy. Is it correct we're going to run into Andromeda? Is that right? Or something like that? Yes. Yeah. So there's going to be a collision of galaxies sometime in the future. And, you know, it sounds sort of dramatic and it can be, but it's basically that stars within our galaxy and stars within Andromeda's galaxy could be uh, basically wrapped in each other's orbits and pull things apart or merge things together. So the shape of our galaxy will change. Okay. And then at some point, our sun is going bye-bye, right? And that's a little bit sooner. What's the story there? Yeah. So our sun is too small to explode as a supernova, but just big enough to basically swell as it gets older and older, and it'll become what we call a red giant. And uh, basically consume all of the inner planets as it swells. So Earth will be, you know, set on fire and sort of gobbled up by the sun. And the sun will sort of get out to the orbit of Jupiter as it gets, you know, swells to this red giant. And then it'll fade into what we call a white dwarf, which is sort of the the cores of stars. Gotcha. And what's the timing on that? Is that like Thursday or... Uh, no, another, you know, several billion years from now. Okay, okay. I just have to answer to my kids when they're just like, hey, this yeah, th- no. this, this lady said everything's going to go boom. What, what, when is that happening? Very far, far in the future. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, I feel like that gives us a little, a little context for this thing. When, how old were you when you first started to kind of grasp all of this? Um, I guess... The, the line between becoming curious about how the stars and the galaxy and the universe works and, you know, again, sort of grasping the timeline and the enorm- how enormous these things are in the scales. I think the, when I first remember asking those questions and thinking about scale, I was in uh, kindergarten or first grade, so like five or six. Mm-hmm. And I remember, so I went to... Uh, an Episcopalian school. And uh, I remember learning about the concept of a God and uh, hearing that God created the universe. And, you know, I'm not religious, but at the time, you know, that's what, you know, I was told. And I remember asking my parents, well, you know, if God created the universe, then who created God? And, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of going on and on from that. And my parents, you know, and great parenting fashion, I guess, just kind of looked at me and they were like, that's a good question. And uh-huh. so I I was just, I was hooked. I was like, I have to learn more and think more and understand more about the scale of, of the universe. That's really Does exciting. Does it scare you at all? You know, that's a, that's an interesting question. I remember the first time um, I was interning at an observatory in college and I was talking to people about you know, the composition of the universe and how we only know 4% or 5% of all matter in the universe and how exciting that was. And people looked at me like I was an alien and they were like, aren't you terrified that we don't know all of this? And I, 
you know, my answer is that didn't even occur to me to be scared. It was, to me, that is some of the most liberating, freeing thoughts of we know so little and there's so much yet to be explored. Um, And as someone who I think is really curious and likes exploring, that's just so exciting to me. Yeah, I, I feel like that makes sense. I, I like the use of of liberating in the sense that it just goes like, it's a little bit like, have you been in an earthquake yet in your time in California? I have, yes. When the, look, hurricanes, terrifying, wildfires, uh, cyclones, tornadoes, the whole thing, right? Scary stuff. Yeah. But when the ground moves, your fundamental assumptions about your sense of control in your life and in the world and just how the world naturally works really go out the window real fast because you our our stupid lizard brains are are really not down with the ground can become wavy for an undetermined period of time yes out of nowhere and we still can't predict it it's it's a tough one um but it's also a little bit it's i imagine it's a little bit like um you know being out at sea when when the sea is really going apeshit and you're just going like I'm very small and right. that's that I I can understand in certain moments how that's terribly scary especially if forty footers are crashing overhead or you're in one of these earthquakes but at the same time with the scale of of our solar system the galaxy the universe and the time scales I think that's probably where that liberating feeling comes in because you're like I'm not going to be here it, yeah exactly I think. You know, I struggle with anxiety and I struggle with really feeling like I want to control my surroundings because that, you know, lowers my anxiety. And I think my love and passion for the universe and and feeling so free when I think about the the context of of how small we are in the grand expanse of the cosmos, to me that is sort of a perfect balm for my anxiety because it reminds me that we are so small and we're transient. We're not going to be around for very long. And all of our problems, all of our struggles and pain and happiness is just a blip in in the universe. And that, uh, for me personally, is incredibly reassuring. Yeah, it, I, I totally... I totally get that. It's funny. My children are very curious and, uh, you know, they're very lucky that very privileged that, you know, mom and dad can buy books and, and fill the house with things that help them quench that curiosity and stoke more of it. And, but they can also really overthink things. So it's the same mm-hmm. thing when they're just like, well, uh, sun's always going to be here. And I'm like, Oh, I actually no, about 5 million years. The same thing. It just keeps growing. It takes us over. And they're just like, quick question. What? Like, yeah. <laughs> what, and, and when, like yeah. you said, we're going to ice cream, and <laughs> but you also just said the sun's going to explode. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to need more detail because their concept, and we know this about how they think. I mean, first of all, that their brains aren't fully developed, but also, you know, to get more biological about it, they're, they're how children perceive time versus how we perceive time because it keeps going faster in the way we forget things, uh, all that stuff. You know, we keep pulling the thread and finding out all things we don't know. But, you know, when you're just like, sun's going to explode, they're like... They, you know, they only know how a week works because I have it on a whiteboard right. on the fridge, <laughs> you know? So five billion years, you can say it as yeah. some magical number, but they don't know what that means. Right, right. Yeah, I think to some extent, it's impossible to really understand these huge numbers, you know, sure. it's a billion years, five billion years, 10 billion years. Like, what does that really mean? We can't really, as humans, put that into any meaningful context that our brain can understand. But having something so big, you know, it's like going out to mountains and you look up at this huge peak and you're like, wow, my brain cannot even wrap my mind around this sort of gargantuan scale that is right in front of me, but it's sure. there. Sure. And so that uh, perspective, even if we can't fully grasp what it means, is still, I think to me, grounding and um meaningful, even if I don't fully understand the difference between a million years, a billion years, 10 billion years. And that's one of the, that's one of the biggest challenges I think of being an astronomer is having to deal with these 
gigantic numbers and scales that, you know, we don't think about on a daily basis here on earth. You know, we think about what happens in the next minute or hour or 24 hours. If I have to think about things in a year, I I have like an anxiety attack. I'm like, I can't process (laughs) what's going to happen. But, but having sort of the, the big, big, big numbers, uh, anchor me helps a little bit with putting, you know, my day to day into perspective. I get that. I can, I can see how it's this balm for anxiety as someone who also, you know, again, whiteboards and to-do systems and jobs and kids. And uh, I try to keep things organized. My wife, uh, she just basically ignores me at this point w- with all of it. And, and understandably so she's this guy. I'm just like the guy who lives there now. Um, but, but this I mean, because we we are almost almost incapable of understanding the raw data of the time and the distances. First of all, mm-hmm. just how big our own galaxy is, and then you're just like, oh, and there's a trillion more, or mm-hmm. how big the universe is, or how it's going to grow. It, it's almost a self awareness of our of our limitations, and then just letting go, right? Right. And going and going. Oh, I. I actually can't understand that. I can talk about it in this relative way, but that's a nice thing because there's not a lot of other things because all our lizard brains doing, especially this past year, is trying to control all these things that we can't control, Mm -hmm. right? That are that are still we talk about this a lot here, like these externalities, like things that you are directly exposed to, whether it's your kids at school or your investments or, or your job or your family, whatever it is, that should feel like they are within your control. But it is nice to kind of look at these grander things or these pictures mm-hmm. from Hubble or might be and just go, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think letting go is really, is really the key. And that's the important thing. And that's something that I struggle to do, you know, in my day to day life, I try very hard to control what I can so that I feel like I am, you know, worthy and succeeding and meaning, giving meaning back to to people around me. But really, you know, at some point you have to, I'm learning to fall deeper into myself rather than trying to deal with the externalities um, of things around me. Because by letting go of, we don't really have control. It's us uh, acknowledging that we don't have control. That's the hard part. So that is something that I am currently working on in my day-to-day life. Good luck. Um, yeah. let, let me know if you figure it out. <laughs> I will. Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a struggle, man. And it, it does. It gets it gets har- immensely harder and easier when, once and if kids show up into your life. Um, yeah. Just be- It's this whole, what, what's the great quote? You know, having a kid is, is, is um, it's like having your heart walk around outside your body. And instantly you're like, you can't go outside here. You can't do this. You can't climb on this chair. You should do this. And it feels like you're saying no all the time, but you have to tell them these are basic safety things. Like, I'm sorry you're frustrated, but I'm trying to keep you from being electrocuted. It's not so fun. Um, And then even in the bigger context of a year like this, um, you know, we just had to explain to our kids, we're not going back to Los Angeles because mommy and daddy aren't fully vaccinated yet. And you won't be for a year and this and this and flights and all this. And, and again, it's, very difficult for them to grasp the enormity of the enormity of it. But it's also, again, this, this moment of like, again, I try to keep both taking a step back to look at the whole picture, but then dialing into going like, can I, can can I control this thing? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Can I control this thing? Yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I am struggling with that when I think back to this year and, you know, I'm fully vaccinated now and I'm very, very lucky to be in that position. But when I grapple with sort of the pain and trauma and struggle that so many people have experienced this last year, it's really overwhelming. I mean, it's like really trying to understand a tsunami as one person. And at some point, it's, um, it's, it's too much. And so having to, when you look at the numbers of sort of the death toll and the number of people who have been infected. And, you know, it's just a, it's not really reflective of it's, it's, it's a low bar for what is actually the real numbers are. It is uh, really difficult to sit with that. And so, you know, at some point, what I am doing is basically 
and I don't know if this is the right or the wrong thing, but processing it in small bits instead of, you know, the whole thing, because the whole thing is just, I mean, it's traumatizing. And there's like collective global trauma uh, from this experience that I think everybody is just trying to process in their own way. And then again, it's like, it's so interesting to take this grander solar system wide, you know, galaxy wide perspective of, you know, there's that great quote, which I'm going to, I'm going to mangle. Was it? Oh gosh. I don't remember who it was. I think it was when they took the, maybe it was either, uh, the pale blue dot picture or mm-hmm. the Earthrise picture. Maybe it was Carl Sagan who in his speech was something like everything that's ever happened happened on that tiny little dot. Yeah. Right? It's Carl. Yeah. And then I thought about, um, there's a great book came out a couple of years ago. George Clooney just made into a movie the book was called uh, good morning. Midnight what was the woman's name and the author. I can't remember. But um, it's great. And, and the movie was really good, too. But essentially, it's these two parallel stories. And it's this scientist in Antarctica working on some things. I don't want to give too much away. And also the, this mission in space that's on its way back to Earth. And something happens uh, in the Antarctica research facility and all the other scientists bail and he decides to stay and finish up. because Something's happening on Earth, like everybody go home. And then at the same time, the, the space mission loses contact with Earth. And it's so interesting when you just, if you stop right there and think they just turn off the communications and none of the rest of the universe would have any idea that we, we had this plague and, or, or we nuked each other, whatever it is, like just get snuffed out that quick. And yeah. again, it gives you that perspective. Um, yeah. Again, the broader, broader, broader perspective that you can either right. really try to wrestle with or try to come to terms with by, by letting go a little bit, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. And I think, you know, here it's reflecting on sort of that story at Carl's, Carl's quote, you know, it gives you some, I think, appreciation for how fragile the earth is and how fragile life is and how incredibly beautiful it is that we get to experience it and that we are just so happen to be on this pale blue dot in the middle of an ocean of universe um and yeah i mean it 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 is both uh you know helps to ground a little bit of these numbers but it's also you know when you think about how fragile life is it makes it makes it that much more painful to really try to conceptualize what's been going on sure but you hope it gives people and this is why i feel like we should send everyone to space to just turn around and have a look at the thing because it gives you this perspective of like We've only been walking around on this thing for like 200,000 years. I mean, yeah. the, like we are basically just above chimps still and we could mess this whole thing up so fast, right. so fast, you know? So they talk about, you know, every people go out and they have a look and they come back and they're like, oh shit, okay, got it. And, yes. you know, you wish you could plug that into to everybody a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the overview effect. There is this like, I would give I so much to be able to uh, go up to space and be able to experience that. <laughs> you know, I read these these accounts and it's just like I think I think I have a little a small fraction of it. You know, I I you know because I try to think about the earth sure. and I try to think about the universe in that context, but it's still like I'm sure it do, it's you know it's just a very small fraction of what it actually feels like to be able to see the earth. Yeah, there's some of the other day was like, you know, it was on some like kids website because I spent half my day on those. It's like, <laughs> what, a, what a science, what do, you know, astronauts do on the weekend? The astronauts like, look through the fucking cupola and look yeah, at earth because totally. it's amazing. What else are we going to like? Are you kidding me? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would be completely glued to the window. 100%. Like I, it would be impossible for me to look anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. My job, like my job would be looking. <laughs> Just that's Great. it. <laughs> Where's Serafina? She's looking out the window again, man. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. She hasn't she hasn't done her treadmill today. Nope. <laughs> um so I want to talk about two sort of pivotal to use a terrible sort of segue moments, ways your academic and your sort of own personal health universe could have could have gone in different directions. So uh First one, in 2019, you you gave this perfect tweet about 
uh, not just failing a quantum physics exam, oh, but yeah. getting a zero, which I thought only I did in college. So thank oh, you. Oh, you, you did that too? I'm uh, glad to meet yeah, someone except else. Yeah, except <laughs> mine were like, I, by the way, I'm like a pagan atheist too, but I was a religion major. So mine were like essays, 20 pages. They're like, your score oh, is zero. No. I'm like, how's it zero? Oh, There's no. got to be something. <laughs> like, oh, what are you talking God, about? Oh, God, that's so painful. Um, but yours is something that matters. So, uh, <laughs> no, and also matter, you were but... incredibly brave and transparent about sharing it. But you finished the tweet by saying, uh, if, uh, j put it here for, and we'll put it in the show notes. Now I'm in a top tier astrophysics PhD program. Again, this was two years ago and published two papers. STEM is hard for everyone. Grades don't mean you're not good enough to do it, which is so great. You didn't quit. Why didn't you quit? Because I imagine that moment was difficult. You're not some superhero who was like, fine, no, I got the next I'm one. Not. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a good question. And it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, especially recently. And I think there's two parts to my answer. The first is, you know, I love the cosmos. I really, despite all of the grades and despite all of the the struggles with um, not being particularly good at physics or math, at least initially, I would have done anything really to be able to study the universe and to have the opportunity to learn more about it. Um, so that was really the like the drive. The, the initial passion was there. And the second thing is this idea of um, what I call learned persistence. So throughout my life, I never felt like I particularly belonged in STEM or um, in physics. And, you know, part of that is because I'm a woman, a brown woman, someone who is not, you know, a genius savant who just kind of gets it. And so I felt really out of place. And because of these sort of implicit and explicit stereotypes and stereotype threats that underrepresented groups deal with when they are in atmospheres like STEM, um, you know, we're told over and over that we don't belong or we're, it's implied that we're, we don't belong. And, um, you know, I've experienced that my whole life. And at some point, I basically, I've had small moments throughout my whole life where I had to decide, do I want to keep doing this or do I not want to? And it's easy to say, I don't, I, this hurts too much. This is too difficult. This mm -hmm. is not something that I want to really have to expose myself to. But I almost by necessity learned that if I wanted to continue to pursue my love, I had to push through and say, basically, fuck it to the people telling me no, and to the grades and say, I'm just going to keep trying because this is something that I love. And so at that moment, when I got a zero, it was just, it really was another one of the a string of reasons why I shouldn't do something. And I just said, well, I want to keep doing it. How can I make that happen? And I did. And so it wasn't that tweet was really, I think so many people, especially women and especially people of color feel like spaces like STEM are not for them. And so, sure. well, we do a terrible job of making room for you. Exactly. Exactly. And so it, I see, and I, you know, I experience this of, you know, wanting to leave at some point because it's too hard it, it, it not because it's, it's like, you're not smart enough. It's because the environment is not conducive to your success. And they, sure. they, I mean, it's, yeah. So that tweet was really to help show that everybody struggles and people if, if you're passionate about something, we should make room for you, basically. Sure. So yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, I I was not <laughs> I, getting a zero is like Jesus Christ. Like, how bad can you possibly it's be at this? Right. Uh, yeah. No, that's that's really hard. But you know, I I I went to my professor right afterwards, and I was like, what the fuck? Like, I got a zero. Do I do I drop the class? Like, do I retake this? I mean, 
do you think I'm an idiot? And, right. you know, he was basically like, no, nah, it's all curved. Like, you, you'll, you'll be fine. Just study for the final and nine three, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. You're like, I, are you, are you sure? Cause I got a zero. Yeah, like this is a <laughs> the big fat circle right. of zero. <laughs> like, right. Right, right, there's right. no extra digits right. here. You? When you say fine, like yeah, I you got do physics, zero. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, math. <laughs> But, you know, it was fine. I ended up getting, I think, a B in the class or a B plus uh, because awesome. everything in physics is curved and I ended up doing pretty is well. Is that a pun? A-O. <laughs> did, you, so. did you change anything after that? Your study habits, the way you thought about it, the way you looked at it, the way you operated within the space you had carved for yourself? You know what? I There are two things that I really, I think grew to understand and three things maybe grew to understand in college. The first is when I started college, when I started physics, I studied for literally like 20 hours a day. I mean, I was like, the more hours I put in, the better I will do on these tests. And so I did, I didn't have a social life, didn't have any sort of like friendship group. I was in a sorority, but I never attended anything because mm-hmm. I was like, I have to do well. And that did not translate to success at all. Um, and that was a hard pill for me to swallow. I did not understand how more hours didn't correlate to better grades. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that was the first thing. And the second thing was finding, finding a community, finding people in my program who I could study with and who could explain things to me in different ways that I started to understand better. And I started to learn how to have a dialogue about physics. I mean, that is not something that I ever learned growing up. And at some point you learn to not just problem solve, you know, on problem sets, but to actually discuss like how things fit together. And it doesn't have to be about formula. It can just be about ideas. And that uh, was totally foreign to me. And it's a skill that I learned throughout college. And then probably the third thing is kind of going back to what we talked about at the beginning of this podcast is letting go a little bit and saying, you know, I got a zero, I can let it, (laughs) you know, sort of, totally destroy my my self of you know worth and or i can just say all right that happened and better luck next time and sort of you know move on and of course i didn't do a perfect job of that but i've learned how to fail maybe sure. is is really a, a concise way of putting and it and that's one of the greatest lessons of all right i mean whether it's in school or some sort of sports or ballet or, or, you know, whatever it might be. Winning is great, but man, learning how to lose, how to fail uh, yeah. on your own or especially with a team and handling that well as a team and coming back the next day. I mean, those things. I have found that there's there's a pretty pretty noticeable difference between folks who experienced that on the way up and folks that never yeah. really were in that situation, whether they didn't put themselves in that situation or their parents wouldn't let them fail for whatever reason. And because, boy, is that a sk- skill that's necessary for literally the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's part of being human, right? There's ups and downs. There's successes and failures. And I think as much as failure hurts, and I fucking hate failing, I really hate it. Sure. Um, but I think... That's where a lot of growth happens and it's uncomfortable, but in discomfort, you grow and you get to experience different parts of life and different parts of yourself that you wouldn't have been able to experience beforehand. So that's, it's easy to talk about. It's easy to say those words. It's really hard to, to be deal clear, with it. To be clear, it sucks in the it. moment. Yeah, it's, it's awful. terrible. <laughs> it's awful, but it's also important. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think, I think, there wasn't like one thing that I changed where I was like, I decided to approach physics in this way after that zero, but it really was this, you know, it was, it was, I let go a little bit and I said, I'm going to trust that I have a community of people that I can have these physics conversations with and I can, you know, sure. start to sleep more and start to, so weird, you know, eat on normal, like <laughs> at normal hours and just right. like, you know, these things that go into be making you um, just sort of, you know, general wellness, like how sure. to just be a functioning human. And it, it worked out. And ironically, by the end of college, I mean, that was, 
think my junior year of college. And by the end, I mean, I, my trajectory and physics knowledge was exponential. So by mm. the end I was like, Oh, I actually kind of get physics or at least parts of physics. And I, sure. you know, I did the best in my, it, like the best that I had ever done in physics classes by my senior year. And it was because once I sort of got the ground, the foundation of physics and learned to started, start to learn how to think about things, the concepts just became a little bit easier to grasp. Sure. And I guess there's a little letting go there as well, right? If 20 hours a day, I mean, this is not apples to apples, but if 20 hours a day in no social life and, and you know, eating like a rabbit uh, yeah. in, in random periods of time equals a zero. And again, yeah. that's not that's not the baseline, but, you know, you can let go of that sense of, of I need to, I need to do everything I can to equal this because it's right. not, it's not basic math. That's not the way these things work. To talk a little bit about some other math you did, you also very transparently shared your inheritance of the bracket two gene, uh, on top of a family history of pretty rough cancers. You chose to have a preemptive double mastectomy, knowing the probabilities, which from what I understand are pretty high of developing breast and ovarian cancer, especially yeah. with the family history. Could you, I guess, to, again, to give some context for folks, and there's been some 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 other stories about this as well. I know Angelina Jolie wrote that whole thing when she did it. Um, right. But can you briefly describe for, for the folks at home, but especially uh, the gentlemen out there, why women in your position, that, that conflux of factors, elect to have a prophylactic surgery? Yeah. My grandmother on my dad's side uh, had ovarian cancer in her 50s and then had pancreatic cancer in her late 60s mm. and died of pancreatic cancer. And at the time, we didn't know about genetic mutations or we sure. didn't know about BRCA. Maybe, it, you know, the science was out there, but we personally did not know about it. Sure. And... So when I was 23, my dad was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. So he was diagnosed at stage four. And uh, typically prostate cancer takes time. Long time. Um, you know, it's, yeah. And it's typically very treatable. Um, in fact, I mean, they, for, they tell guys who get it in their like 70s and 80s, like, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. And for him, he basically went from presumably healthy to stage four in like six months. So it was sort of a, you know, uh, shocking and it was, you know, obviously really scary. My dad is my best friend. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of pain there. And right after he was diagnosed, basically his oncologist and his team of doctors said, yeah, I think you should get genetic testing because typically prostate cancer doesn't behave this way. Mm -hmm. And so he got genetic testing, came back positive for BRCA2. And right after he got his positive result, I decided to go get tested and came back positive, which for me means I have an 87% lifetime risk of breast cancer, which is... It, to me, that's like, all right, well, then I'm going to get breast cancer. It's, no, not, I mean, like, it, it's not a guarantee, but it, it's uh, No, but, but in a world where, I mean, and we, we've especially seen this, you know, this year, but humans, again, are lizard brains, like, we're really bad with thinking in a probabilistic way. But yeah. when we have overwhelming odds, like, uh, yes. you know, this vaccine will, <laughs> is, you know, right. will reduce your chance of getting it, you know, again, loosely 90%. That's right. pretty big. Um, and 87% mm -hmm. is no joke. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and then for ovarian cancer, it's like 30%, you know, so it's still incredibly high um, relative, yeah. especially to what it typically is, which I think it's like, you know, I don't know, something quite low. Something in lower than 37%. Or, 12 yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, you know, after I got my, my positive test result, I uh, went through this period of, um, frankly, denial. Uh, you know, I was 23 and I, my dad was sick and I was like, I can't think about my own stuff because sure. I'm not able to, it's like my brain just could not comprehend that. Sure. Um, and I didn't have to, you know, I was very lucky in that I was young. I was healthy. I didn't have any symptoms or any sort of reasons why I needed to deal with it right at that moment. 
So I, you know, I moved to Berkeley. I started grad school and my first year of grad school, I think I was 25. You're supposed to start screening for uh, breast cancer if you're BRCA2 at 25. So I went in to get my first MRI and it showed a spot and I freaked out. Yeah. I lost it. Um, I went in for a biopsy, had to wait the full you know week of um, checking my phone every two seconds and thinking, you know, what if I have cancer? What if I have cancer at the same time my dad has cancer? How do I... Sure. I mean, it was it was too much. And it came back that it was benign, but they wanted to monitor it every six months. Um, and I was like, absolutely, I can't do this. I cannot go through this every six months, especially when I know that I can get a preventive double mastectomy and not ever have to think about breast cancer again. Hopefully. Sure. Right. So, you know, I started doing a ton of research of, yeah typical PhD student. It's like, what does the data say? What is the science? How do I get some control over this situation? And so I, I'm not, I don't have any history in uh, the medical world, but I started, you know, I was on PubMed and I went combed through papers after papers after papers. And I put together this like 10 page list of, of studies. And I went to my oncologist and she was like, we can publish a peer review paper based on this. <laughs> and I was like, great. Um, but you know, I was just like, I think I'm ready. I'm ready for this. Um, and she was like, you know, I, I agree. I think this is the right decision for you, which really helped. I mean, it was having a woman, having a, a, a an oncologist who was a woman helped me feel like she understood a little bit about what sure. I was going through. And uh, she was able to, I think, empathize in a in a deeper way, perhaps, than um, I would have had if I had had a, a male doctor. Sure. Can I and, pause, just to pause sure, right there? Yeah. So, you know, when we go through life again, you know, your dad's cancer, like you said, happened very quickly in a way that he, that one usually does not. And yours, obviously... Uh, you know, now with so much more genetic testing, more and more women um, are finding out about this or people are finding out about ALS genes, whatever, you know, what it, we're finding right. out so much more, which can be uh, harrowing and scary. Um, and often we don't fully understand both personally and scientifically understand the implications of some of these newer things versus something right. like BRCA, where we where we have, like you said, 87%. I mean, that's we have yeah. a pretty good idea of what that means, you know? Yes. Um, versus, again, some of this, and I've had ALS in my family, like, you know, they're finding these new genes, and they're like, listen, we think this is probably one of the more prominent buttons. We're not totally sure what it does, right. but it's very easy to send people spinning out. But right. when things happen, or you discover information that's a little bit, trying to think of the best way to put this, out of the normal scope of how that condition or precondition happens, right? So yours is at 23, your dad's is early. Um, it, it can be harder to find folks who can empathize in a really direct way, support groups of people who went through it at 23 years old or your dad's course, age or yeah. whatever. So you had this wonderful um, uh, oncologist who, who was a woman who could obviously empathize much more than a man could, but was there anything else out there uh, socially that you were found of, of folks who could could help you talk talk you through that? Yeah, um, this was a hugely important part of my journey. Basically, right after I decided to move forward with my mastectomy, I found this group online um, on Instagram called the Breasties, and amazing. Yeah, fantastic name. Fuck, that's great. It's so good. It's so good. Um, <laughs> and they're completely organized around young people who are affected by hereditary reproductive cancers. Mm -hmm. Um, So breast and ovarian cancer Mm -hmm. primarily. Um, And so I found two of my best friends from this group. Um, One of them was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 28, just starting business school at Yale and um, basically had to defer business school and go do chemo for a year and have many surgeries. And, um, you know, it's a completely different experience talking to young people and young women who are affected by this as compared to sort of the, you know, when I thought of breast cancer before all of this, I thought Mm -hmm. of, you know, sort of a a 40, 50 year olds, which is still young, but you know, a 40, 50 year old woman who 
has a life is, you know, is established in, you know, her own space. And, um, this was completely different. You know, I, I felt like I was just starting. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what, you know, what I'm doing and where I am and, and what I spend my time on. And suddenly I'm faced with sort of having to think about life or death and having to think about, um, how to save my own life. Um, and people, in their twenties typically don't have to think about that. You know, thankfully they, they don't have to ask those questions. And, uh, it was really challenging. It was really challenging to be, you know, this is back when you could go out to bars and, you know, when you could don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's a totally different universe, but, um, I'd go out with some friends and, uh, I remember feeling like they were talking about, you know, romance and and guys and dating and i was like i i feel like i can't understand anything of what you're saying because yeah. all i am thinking about is a mastectomy and you know dying and cancer and sure. it's just like it was two different worlds and so to be able to find a community of people who are young who understand what this feels like um it saved me really. I mean, I never understood the idea of a support group and the besties and that's not how they brand themselves, but it really is like having a community, having yeah. a community is so important. Yeah. Um, whether it's in physics in, in STEM or in this, um, I found it to be, uh, life changing. Mm-hmm. It can go a really long way and it's really, it can be painful and really just can feel disassociative to have these people who would otherwise be your, your besties, your, yeah. your, your closest friends, the people who've listened to all of your other problems, your romance, whatever it might be, right. who to no fault of their own simply cannot understand the, the moment you're in and the decisions, the information you're, you're compiling and, and processing and the decisions you have to make. And it's not yeah. their fault, but that's why finding groups like that can make just an enorm- an enormous difference. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a journey to not feel betrayed a little bit by some of my friends, my, you know, former, n- not former friends, but friends who uh, I was friends with before this diagnosis, um, who couldn't really show up in the way that I, I really wanted them to, Sure, but that's to no fault of their own. It's just, everybody is at a different place in their life. You know, everybody has different experiences and emotional capacities and, you know, approach, uh, big problems and big, scary yeah. topics differently. And so it was really, again, invaluable to be able to find people who intimately understood what it was like, and not even just from our own journeys and our own diagnoses, but also having immediate family members, parents who were diagnosed, some of them have died, um, from cancer. And so having that sort of, you know, uh, parent daughter, parent son relationship, uh, is something obviously I understand, uh, in a very intimate way because I deal with that with my own dad and, and his cancer. And so that just adds another dynamic and another, uh, part that that really strengthens those relationships. It does. It's um, I I have uh I haven't been faced personally in my own body with something like that. Uh, one of my best friends died of cancer very quickly about ten years ago, and uh, he was very young. I'm so not, sorry. Not not not. Thank you. I mean, you know, grief changes over time for sure. Um, it doesn't go yeah. away, but it changes a lot, especially when you have different perspectives and kids and life. But um, yes. you know, not 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 anywhere near like your dad, but not dissimilar. He had a cancer that was mostly for, uh, to this point, because of the society we built, was mostly, it was esophageal cancer, uh, the metastasized, but that's usually like over 65-year-old black men who've been smoking their whole life. That's the basic thing. And he was like a 29-year-old college soccer player, white guy, privileged, ran marathons. And he was, you know, gone like that. But it is interesting how just that in itself uh, can give you a lot of perspective. Oh, Um, absolutely. But also... Again, and again, I was, um, gosh, when that happened, 25. And I mean, to be clear, like, especially guys in your 20s, you are, the best word is, I mean, you're, you're basically a moron at that point, right? 
You're just like (laughs) an emotionally, (laughs) you know, like stunted moron. And so you said it on me. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'll put it on a bumper sticker. I mean, that was me a thousand percent. You know, it's, it's how I always feel like watching professional athletes and they yell at like, you know, the 22 year old point guard who went out to a club the night before a game. I'm like, I don't even remember 22. Like, what are you talking? Like, I can't fault that kid. Are you kidding me? Yeah. But yeah. anyways, you know, it happened very early and it gives you a lot of perspective. And it's also really interesting to, in the moment, have the friends who show up ride or die who don't understand and they're like, I don't get it, but I'm not right. going anywhere. Right. And the ones who don't and the ones who can't, and it's yes. not their fault. And you can have some antagonism about that in the moment. You can take a step back. Anyways, it's all, it's a, it's a wild journey and nobody should have to go through it, but kind of like getting a zero on a test. Um, it's terrible to say, but I'm sure you wish you didn't have a double mastectomy and I wish my friend hadn't right. died, but I probably also wouldn't have moved to California and, to right. chase a girl and made three kids. And that's interesting, you know? Yeah. To, and you can certainly wrestle with that at times still, but um, yeah, it's interesting how that can kind of move us forward a bit. Yeah. I think, you know, I go to therapy every week and yeah. one of the things that my, <laughs> love therapy, um, but the best. <laughs> one of the things that my therapist says uh, that I'm learning is how we have, only part of the picture, right? There is a sure. there is a big, you know, even to the basically scale of the universe picture of what is out there. And we just can't, our lizard brains cannot understand it, yeah. right? We have a very narrow perspective of our own lived experiences. And that, that's how we translate everything. And that's how we derive meaning from the world around us. And, you know, when I went through this, you know, mastectomy, I, you know, that's all I focused on. It was like, I have this thing and it's really scary. And then I'm done with it. And it's my whole identity. And, you know, now I'm a year out and I am able to start to, you know, live life in not just that narrow view, right? Like I'm a scientist, I get to go hiking and I get to do all these other things that are not shaped entirely, at least by that diagnosis. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard in the moment to be able to see that it's hard to be able to see t- the the context and, and, um, you know, there is so much that I, I am in a completely different place, both, you know, as, as a human being emotionally and professionally than I was before my diagnosis. And mm-hmm. part of that is, you know, I never could have anticipated, I never could have anticipated, you know, I would it sounds so cliche and I probably, I don't think I fully believe this, but it's not that I'm grateful that I have BRCA and it's not that I'm grateful that I have my mastectomy, but I can treat it as, uh, this thing happened and it's part of life. And now I'm, I'm moving on to some, you know, some new chapter and that's, and it's informed by what happened to me. It's not good or bad. It just is. Um, and I think that's a perspective that's really important, you know, whether it's a getting a zero on an exam or having a mastectomy, it's like these really painful, terrible things happen. Um, and it happens and, you know, there's another moment, there's another, there's forward, right? Yeah. Yeah. Universe keeps distancing itself no matter what we do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think about, you know, my, my poor, my poor wife, we met, uh, we met literally at a Caribbean wedding over Jello shots, um, and oh, that's amazing. Uh, we did long distance. And we had met. She was in LA, and I was in New York, working crazy hours. And I lived my, this. My friend who died, like, lived with me for a little bit, and then he he lived near my office. And so we drink and talk every night about what we're going to do. All of a sudden, the guy is gone, and my poor wife. I wow. mean, we we had, we had met like five. I mean, long distance. You've actually like met like five yeah. times in your life, especially if you if you didn't know each other before, and. All of a sudden, like, this is not what she signed up for when she met, like, guy in board shorts at Caribbean wedding, you know? (laughs) But she (laughs) was like, well, I'm going to show up because this is the kind of person I am. And it's been interesting. Again, I'm not thankful for it. But we are also aware in the in the universe of our relationship that, you know, some relationships don't go through hard stuff for quite a while. 
And then you mm-hmm. find out some shit, you know, about how you right. guys handle things. And that was like the prequel to our relationship was right. like literally the hardest thing, you know? So yes. it, that's, I'm again, I'm not thankful for it, but times I'm just like right. very aware that we can handle anything. And that's right. interesting. Yeah. You know? I, I, I very similar in you know, my, my boyfriend and I started dating, uh, I think, uh, what was it? Like six months before I had my MRI. And then, you know, within nine months I had my first surgery and he was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just yeah. so happened yeah. that this, yeah. you know, this person was able to show up and be there in a way that was authentic to him and felt good. And sure. obviously it was hard, but you know, not every relationship could withstand that. And, you no. know, I, it, it, it's interesting having to go through that pain and hardship at the, at the very beginning yeah. of a relationship. And it either, in my opinion, either makes or breaks the relationship. Yeah. Fully. Um, and so, you know, now we're, you know, three years into our relationship and it's like a completely, I feel like it, in some ways we're a 20 year old couple, right? Because we've sure. gone through, or sorry, 20, 20 years. Yeah. Together couple, yeah. 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 Um, because we've gone through so much and, and, and not everybody goes through that at the very beginning and that's okay. Um, nor should would, everybody, you know, wish you know, that but on at anybody. the same time, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, it is interesting how, again, it's like, you see only part of the picture when you're in it and, uh, broadening that perspective and broadening that picture and saying like, nothing is inherently really, I mean, nothing is inherently, I think good or, or bad. I mean, that's a blanket statement, but like, for example, my dad diagnosed with terminal cancer and now he says it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to him because he lives a completely different life that he never would have lived beforehand. And he loves it. I mean, he practices yoga every day. He is on the beach. He, um, you know, just has this completely different outlook towards life and, and his own meaning in life now, uh, that he never could have accessed before his diagnosis. And so it's really interesting how people process trauma and, um, yeah. derive meaning from it and, and being able to sit, just put one foot in front of the other, I think. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about constellations? I would love to talk about constellations. Um, so I have essentially, I don't want to say like brainwashed is such a strong word that people <laughs> use, but like, I basically force my children to watch Constellations and and Emily's Wonder Lab, like, on repeat, I would say. And, I mean, my ch- it's also, like, the happiest they are. They're just like, yeah, 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 leave the room. I mean, they watch, it makes them so happy because it is just, there is so much, between the two of you, it is so effervescent and so passionate and knowledgeable, of course. Uh, why do you feel so uniquely suited to do that job. First of all, my heart is bursting. That makes me it's, so happy. It's the greatest thing in the world. So happy. All I do is tweet um, Netflix all the day. Everyone's just like, renew Emily's <laughs> Wonder Lab, fuckers. What are you That's doing? incredible. Yeah, no, yeah. seriously. They, they need to renew that show. It's fantastic. Why do I feel uniquely suited? Oh, God. Um, I mean, I'm not, right? Like, I, there are so many science communicators out there who are excellent, who sure. are so good, so sure. passionate, so excited about what they're doing, and they're knowledgeable. You know, I feel like what I I got very lucky to be able to do the show. I'm one of many. There's a lot of really talented, wonderful people out there. I think, you know, one of the things that I like to bring to every science communication that I do and really everything I do is I am authentically me. Like mm-hmm. I don't pretend to be anybody else because I get too much anxiety to try to pretend to be <laughs> somebody else. You know, like yeah. I'm just going to be me. And if somebody doesn't like it, that's sucks but that's fine because you know that's who i am and uh you know i think part of me being me is i fucking love space and i love talking about it and i could talk to a wall about space like i literally could talk to anything and so (laughs) that you know it's like sure i'll talk to a camera and whether one person watches it or uh, you know five million people like i really it doesn't matter i mean it's great but like i We'll talk to anybody about it. So, you know, Constellations in particular was really fun because 
It was a it was a, a a unique show in that it didn't just talk about science. It talked about the cultural implications of science, which I really liked because sure. science is is inherently human. Sure. Um, there, you know, we are humans doing it, and so we need to talk about that. They're inseparable. I mean, exactly. we, we used to punish humans for for science for scientific theories and things like that. I mean, you can't right. take these things away. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think trying to pretend that science is, is uh, pure and true and, and separate from humans is, is an incomplete picture. Sure. So that's one of the things I love about the show. And I was very lucky to work with a team where I could help develop the, the episodes and the script. And so that was really cool because I was like, I want to do a whole episode on Beetlejuice. And they were like, great, let's yeah. do a whole episode on Beetlejuice. So, it, you know, it's been, it's been really fun to be able to, uh, <laughs> Not just get to talk about astronomy, but get to choose what I talk about um, and spend, you know, uh, however long the episodes are, eight minutes. But really, that's a recording time of like five hours, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> uh, getting to, to, you know, share my coolest, happiest, uh, most exciting parts about the universe with people. And especially, you know, part of it was, you know, we're stuck in our homes right now. Um, yeah. We are, you know, trying to retain some semblance of life, uh, when life is so different right now. And so, you know, what can we do to, uh, experience the universe, uh, when we can't go into the lab or, you know, we can't go to a telescope. And the cool thing is all you have to do is go outside to your backyard and look up at the night sky and it's right there. Um, and so part of the show was to give people tools to be able to just walk outside and say, Oh, well, I can, you know, look at the Big Dipper and then, you know, go down a particular degree and say, oh, that's that's Saturn. You know, that's that's really cool. People can start to access the sky in hopefully a, a, a little bit different way um, by watching this show. So that was really exciting for me. It's so rad. It's um, it's addictive and and it makes you go like, shit, I want to know more about this, which is just like the greatest thing, whether you're an adult or a kid. I mean we're in sort of this golden age of incredible kids entertainment, I guess we can call it in, in so many different ways, you know, but I, I grew up on Sesame street and all this stuff. And now you've got, of course you got Daniel tiger and Emily's wonder lab and constellations and, and all this stuff. You got Muppets and Snoopy and space. I mean, it, it's amazing, but there's also just, you know, there's the lazy versions of, and our, my kids are, my kids are so sheltered. They think like blueberries are dessert and that like your show is the only thing on TV. Um, oh, this, that makes me happy. And I, I, put, I put them to bed like seven o'clock. They're like, the sun's out. Yeah. And like, Sorry. <laughs> Don't have their friends are up till nine eating sugar. Exactly. Um, but great. so it's, the point is like, it's easy. It's easy when you're exhausted to be the parent who's just like put on Frozen again and like go out of the room. By the right. way, Frozen's amazing. But it is, it's amazing to have something like this um, where you could be talking to them about anything and they are into it because of the energy you bring to it, which is well, thank so you. rad. That is incredibly nice of you to say. I'm, no. I'm flattered. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I mean, it would kill me if I didn't talk to you at this point. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't get to make decisions anymore. Well, um, thank you. So your, your history, your, your stories of academic setbacks, if that's what we're calling a zero now, which I wish that's how I could have framed it in college. Ooh, it's yeah. a setback instead of my parents being like, what exactly. the fuck? These setbacks taking this very mature preventative action against cancer. It seems like we, we've talked about this, these, these common themes, which are interesting. It's I, I, this, I, I've kind of honed in on this sentence the past year, especially of all you can do is all you can do. Right which is both letting go, but also like putting whatever you can into the things that you can do. Right. So you, you have, you've learned to let go of some things, but also you, you fought like hell to, for, for your place in this world as a brown woman um, who was immediately judged by your look and, and, and your, your body, which you've had to change. You weren't accepted in this specific world you wanted to be in this part of the ever expanding universe. Right. Um, yeah. But, the, the, this part you have carved like means so much to to not just kids but to, to you and pro I'm, I am assuming to so many other women and, and young brown women in academia and elsewhere. You know where again I, bouncing back for like how the universe is gonna <laughs> gonna gonna die and and this guy's gonna get a dark versus like your biology. You know we're we're all 
what did Carl say, stardust. Yeah. But you are taking up a lot of room, which is awesome. So I want to, I, I wonder if everything sort of we've talked about and you've learned, like, what lessons can you share about how to reconcile sort of this inevitable end of the universe and letting go of that and, and making the most of our, what can be very brief time here? Yeah, I love the way you frame that. You know, one thing I talk about when I talk about science communication or when I talk about mentorship and encouraging people to um, to enter STEM if that's what they want or sure. do you know whatever they want um, is to find something you're passionate about uh, and don't let anybody tell you that you're not good enough to do it or that you're not you don't belong in that space. Because nobody gets to nobody gets to say whether you are good enough for something than other than you. Like you get to choose what you want to do. And obviously, all of that is couched in there's systemic oppression, there's systemic racism, right? There is systemic homophobia and transphobia. And you know, a lot of especially marginalized people. That's, a, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's incredibly difficult to say I'm passionate about something and I'm just going to keep following that no matter what, because yeah. it's very painful. And, um, oftentimes, uh, it's impossible, but you know, I, I think finding something that you love and that you're passionate about is at least the very first step. Uh, to me, finding a community is hugely important. Finding a community, um, in whatever intersection of your identity, uh, you feel speaks to you uh, is incredibly powerful because those people can support and validate and lift you up and um, help give you space to have a voice. And yeah, I, I think those are the two most important like action items I would say. And, and finally, like this is a little bit broader, but I think remembering how small we are, remembering how everything changes, everything is transient. You know, we really don't have control over the universe, mm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, but because of that, we get to play and explore and find purpose mm -hmm. and not to take ourselves too seriously, right? Like, you sure. know, we're just human beings trying to make a, our way through the world and that's okay. You know, that's that's what keeps me sane. I think when I get so bogged down in whatever research problem I'm facing or whatever health problem I'm facing, it's, you know, taking a step back and finding myself, uh, reassured by the perspective of the universe. Sure. That's what I think fuels me and keeps me going. I love that. Nitty gritty. Are there any specific organizations or causes that you believe in or you support where folks could give attention or time or money to support whatever they're doing, whatever you're doing. We'd like to really be specific with folks. So they can just mash their button against the play button or the donate button or, or whatever it yeah. might be and, and feel like they're doing something. I love that. I think the two organizations I will, you know, I already talked about the Breasties. Um, mm -hmm. They're a nonprofit. Highly recommend. Greatest name ever. Yeah, uh, yep. highly recommend uh, th their organization, and the other one is Girls Who Code. They, yes. you know, they're fantastic, and and I think especially for for girls and for young girls of color, it's really important. So, yeah, um, both of those, I, I am I'm really passionate about. Awesome, awesome. Well, we will yeah. definitely put those in the show notes. Um, okay, last couple questions, and I'm going to let you get out of here because it's been like your entire day here. Like the sun has changed <laughs> from your window. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jesus. No, it's great. I love it. You're so kind to spend the time. So, uh, Serafina, when was the first time in your life you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? I think I was like 12. I just gone to science camp and this astronomer who came to visit told me I couldn't be an astronomer. And I, you know, I was like 11 <laughs> and I was like, Fuck you! I'm going to be an astronomer. <laughs> do you do you have this guy's like social security number or address? Dude, or anything? I know. I need to look him up. <laughs> I need to be like, excuse me, sir. Oh, <laughs> I uh, just want to let you know. <laughs> uh huh. I'm an astrophysicist now. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 No. Um. That was probably. I mean, that was the first time when I when I conceptualized. You know, maybe 
people don't think I can do this thing and don't want me to do this thing. And also I want to do it. So I'm going to do it. I love it. I love it. Who is someone in your life that's positively impacted your work in the past six months? Not my dog. I mean, look, we can say, we, we talked about the dogs. <laughs> it can a hundred percent be your dog. Um, I mean, comments you know, amazing. He is amazing. He, he helps me more than he knows. I would actually, I would probably say Emily Calandrelli. Yeah. She, uh, you know, I looked up to her for so long and we've become friends over the last year. We met almost exactly a year ago and, um, it's been challenging finding women in this space who, (laughs) no pun intended, who uh, (laughs) have the same, you know, dreams and passions and uh, way of communicating and total unequivocal support. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there is like, there's no jealousy or bitterness or trying to tear each other down. I mean, it really is just like comes from a place of love and support and elevating people. And Emily is just fantastic at that. Um, so it's been really cool to get to know her and, um, have someone, you know, as as a friend and someone to look up to. Uh, she's really, I think making the world a better place and making my life better. So I'm very awesome. We'll take it. Uh, Serafina, what's your self care? What are you doing these days? Ooh, I do yoga every day. Okay. I sleep at 10 PM every night. Awesome. Um, and uh, I go on, you know, we live right by a, a forest. So I get to go on walks in the forest with Comet, you know, Amazing. almost every day. So yeah, I, I think really taking time for me, I never did, did that growing up. I mean, in a conscious way and claiming that time for myself has been so important. I love that. Yeah. The, I love the, I'm so down with the forest bathing thing that they oh, talk yeah. about. It's, it's, a, it's the greatest. It's lovely. That's exactly how Los Angeles feels. I'm kidding. It's not at all. It's a disaster. Um, <laughs> yeah. What, not sure about that. What is a uh, book that you read this year that has either opened your mind to something you hadn't considered before, something new to you, or has changed your thinking in some way? And we've got a whole list we put on Bookshop, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. I would say Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Okay. Uh, it is this book about... I think the the line is be the cheetah. So Amazing. yeah, it's really, you know, sort of uh, unabashedly claiming, you know, who you are and not letting yourself be trapped or encumbered by societal norms or expectations and, and being fully authentically yourself. I love her writing and I, you know, I derive a lot of meaning from um, sort of her own personal journey. So Highly awesome. recommend. Rock and roll. That'll go on there. Serafina, where can our community follow you on the internet? Yeah, I am on all social. I don't know. I don't know what all the social platforms There's are. There's too actually. many. It's too, it's too much. I don't it's know why I said that. <laughs> I'm on two. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> uh, at starstricken SF. Yeah, so find me there. Okay, rock and roll. Where can they find Constellations? It is on all Seeker platforms on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I don't know if there are more, but those are the big ones. Um, okay. And just look up Constellations and there will be all eight episodes of the first season. Amazing. Thank you for sharing Thank all you. this and for all of your time. It's been four hours, so I apologize. <laughs> It's been a whole day. <laughs> it's been a whole day. Everything's over. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it for everything you're doing, for thank sharing you. with us, and this for great. Uh, all of your bravery and transparency about your journey. It's it's pretty awesome, and it makes, I think, the journey probably a little easier for some folks, which is great. Thanks, Quinn. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for all the great questions. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. Thanks to our incredible guest today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at importantnotimp. Just so weird. 
Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us. You know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.